everybody and welcome to episode 15 of the Bau podcast, the last episode before our summer break. Today our guest is Margot L'Espagnard. Margot is a PhD researcher at VUB, the Vrije Universiteit Brussel in Architectural Engineering. In her research, she aims to develop circular design guidance for architects when designing circular affordable housing. She does this under supervision of engineer architects Niels de Temmerman and Waldo Gallo. Her research ob obviously leans very closely to what we want to achieve at Bau Living, so we thought it would be interesting to have a conversation with her about this. So let's dive into it. Hello, my ho. How are you doing? Hello, I'm doing well. Okay, <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, I thought we would start at the uh, beginning. Can you tell us a little bit more about the research you are currently doing at the VUB? Yeah, so uh, my research is about affordable circular housing, um, where I don't only look at how circular building uh, can become more affordable, but also how um, circular building can help uh, housing become more affordable. Um, what I mean with circular building is the way we build in a circular economy. So it's an economy where we try to minimize as much waste as possible. Uh, this can be done, for example, by uh, reusing materials that already exist today, but also by uh, reusing making sure that we can build and design buildings where we can reuse materials in the future, or even uh, making sure that the buildings that we build today or the buildings that are already there today that we can use them for as long as possible. So in that way, minimizing waste and moving from our linear economy that we have uh, right now for, or the main, the main economy that we have right now is a linear economy where uh, we build something, we uh, use it and then we throw it away. In a circular economy, we actually try to, yeah, as I said, reuse everything and make sure that most of the uh, materials don't go to waste. Now, this circular economy is mainly looked at from an environmental point of view. I think you already see that from the story that I'm telling with reusing materials and stuff. But actually, uh, there's a number of researches that show that um, a circular economy can also um, have financial benefits. And then we're speaking mostly about uh, financial benefits in the long run. For example, um, yeah, if you reuse materials within a project, you don't have to buy new materials when you are doing a renovation or something like this. Uh, there are also other uh, examples of how you can uh, yeah, save, save money in the long run. But as I said, it's mainly in the long run. And what we see today in, in the, the housing market, this is where the housing story comes in. In the housing market, we mainly see that uh, we are oft more often than not looking at uh, the, the initial uh, prices um, and we are currently facing a housing crisis um, maybe partially not <laughs> completely but partially maybe because of that because we don't look at what happens in the long run um, and there are some financing models for housing so alternative housing finance financing models um, like cooperatives community land trusts and so on uh, that take a more long-term approach and so these uh, housing models, we, we think, or hi our hypothesis is that they could really benefit from the long-term uh, profits or the long-term benefits of circular building. And by combining them or looking where at where are the synergies of circular building with these alternative housing models, we are trying to see yeah, where they can benefit from each other. And so, um, yeah. Really, is that clear? Yeah, it's very clear. I was just wondering because you explained that the you think that there's a, a link between the fact that today everything is linear mm -hmm. in the housing market, so it gets it gets sourced, transported, installed, and then it stands there for a couple of decades, and then it gets destroyed most yeah. of the time. But you mentioned that you think that there's a correlation between that way of doing things and the housing shortage that we are facing today. Um, and not necessarily, I think. It's not necessarily the housing shortage. 
Um, it's more the the afford affordability. Okay. Um, but I think I think it goes. I think there is maybe not even a correlation between the linear market, linear no, not the linear market, the uh, linear, linear way of working, linear way of working, and uh, the housing shortage. I think it's more that we. Uh, we are facing a lot of environmental problems recently, and so we will have to move to a circular economy. Um, but that's not necessarily a problem. This could actually be beneficial for um, for the housing market and and the the yeah the long term benefits that you can have from circular building. Um, so I don't think there's really a correlation between a linear market and the housing shortage. Um, uh, but and that's also not really what the the, <laughs> the research is about, actually. Okay. Um, but it's quite a big subject, right? So you wanna yeah. you wanna make construction more circular, and by making it more circular, more affordable. That's the idea. Uh, yes, and okay. that sounds that sounds very uh, challenging. Um, it does. Yeah. But yeah, the, the the research is mainly looking at uh, the design. So. It's looking at how can um, which circular design decisions that designers make, how can they benefit long-term housing mo housing models like cooperative houses or uh, community land trusts? Which circular decisions, like for example, using demountable walls um, or making very simple uh, simple connections in a building or something, how can they and when do they Bene when do uh, cooperatives and stuff, when do they benefit from that? Mm -hmm. And how do you start at this? Because it's a very big problem. Mm -hmm. It's a really complex market and a very complex product. Yeah. Because a house, just one house, is already quite complex to have it sourced, designed and built. But then there's also the extra complexity that every house in Belgium is different, or most of them, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you start like, trying to s come up with solutions that are applicable to most buildings, while most buildings are also very different? And So what's the process? How do you start at this? That's my um, question. Yeah, I started by trying to understand how the market works today. Um, so I started with doing um, uh, a number of interviews, I think about 20 something interviews with uh, social housing developers, architects, uh, other like the um, like developers of alternative housing model of houses within the for, uh, alternative housing models, um, but also researchers uh, and, and inhabitants as well. And to trying to draw up a, a, a view of what uh, is happening today already. Um, and what I found out there, uh, what my first well, real, real lesson was, was that everyone has a different view on what affordable housing actually is, especially because talking about affordable housing is not enough. You should really talk about qualitative affordable housing. Um, because when I started, I, I did like maybe in three weeks, I did, I did these 20 interviews in about three weeks, so almost every day I did an interview, and every day my idea of affordable housing was changing because everybody's idea was different. Um, and so it was important, for, so the, some people were saying like, yeah, affordable housing, it's like in literature, if you pay more than 30% of your household income, then uh, your house is unaffordable. Um, which is, by the way, 20% of Flemish households live that way. Just throwing it out there. Um, o only 20%, you mean? 20% is a lot, no? But oh, no, no. They, so they pay, they pay more, more, 20% pays more than. Right, than 30%. 30%. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there were others saying, like, yeah, but um, having good ventilation, um, having enough light, uh, enough space enough heating is also quite important. And then there were others saying like, yeah, but a neighborhood is also important. Um, uh, social contact is important. And the list went on and on. Mm -hmm. And so I, I found that before even thinking about all these 
these different types of housing project. It was just important to kind of understand what affordable housing is in itself. Or, and I, I, I started feeling like affordable is not even the right term. It became more like equitable housing. And I kind of made my own definition in a sense of what, it's, what it means, um, where I defined like four groups in which you have uh, different uh, 15 dimensions of affordable housing. So you have, I don't know if that's... Maybe. Wait, so you, you, you no longer called it affordable housing, but you called it what? Equitable. Okay, so and what does that stand for? Um, it's, it's taking into account not only financial uh, aspects but all, and building aspects. So in the beginning it was only financial and the, the building itself that I took into account. But now I also look at uh, some social aspects as well, like in the neighborhood, social contact, uh, privacy, safety, and so on. But also uh, the uses of the building, so energy performance, uh, um, maintenance, and so on. Um, and the thing is that I cannot calculate everything of this, of course. And all of these aspects are also very context specific, very personal as well, because housing is a, is a personal thing. It's the way you live. Um, and so what I did then was try to uh, discuss with uh, stakeholders in the field based on projects. I tried to discuss like how how does your project fit, fit into this definition? Where are your, um, what, what are your ideas about um, social contact? How does your project deal with, um, with maintenance costs and so on? Trying to kind of figure out uh, whether this definition was adequate enough, let's say. Um, and then this, def this definition along with, uh, with, an other, um, with another method like uh, life cycle costing is now in the rest of the research serving as a sort of validation for um, yeah, tests that I, design tests that I'm doing with case study projects where I'm looking at the actual design decisions. Like if you would uh, use the mountable walls in a building, what does, does that do for building costs? What does that do for the definition of affordable housing that I've developed, if that makes sense? <laughs> it does, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I understand is that affordable housing, of course, is a bit a very broad definition. So you wanted to specify what, f what falls under an affordable house and yeah. indeed maybe the general rule was if it's less than 30 percent of your income it's affordable mm -hmm. but i understand there's more to an affordable house than just the rent that you pay it's also the expenses that need to go into the house to keep it up to standard yeah but 15 that i what a I, I get that you wanted to like define the definition, but now you say there are 15 variables to the affordable or equ equitable, equitable, yeah. equitable housing. What are the 15? And then there was also uh, the neighborhood. That's part of the 15. Yes. Yeah. And then maintenance. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah, yeah. The 15 is a lot. Yeah. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to develop uh, for e I'm not gonna develop everything. Uh, like I'm not gonna define like in every project you should stay within these boundaries for uh, social ha social contact or this is the best way to have social contact or anything like that because that's just unachievable. I mean, also mm -hmm. I'm not a sociologist or mm -hmm. a, a psych psychologist, so some of the dimensions are more like sort of passive knowledge that I should take into account and there are also things that uh, I, I discuss with um, with people who are actually designing the case studies that I'm working on um, but they are not necessarily something that I study in itself it's more like you should take it into account when you're designing a house um, and so in that way um, yeah they, they sort of serve as a reminder like think about the social contact of the people living in this case study. Think about um, the energy that they will be using in this case study or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, I'm, I already learned something new. 
affordable affordability is just way more than indeed it, and it makes sense if you think about it if you give it if you spend some time on it it indeed makes sense that it's more than just what goes out every month that there's mm-hmm. more to it than just that okay all right so then we have a definition of affordability but then of, yeah. a definition yeah eh? yeah but then the second part of the research is circular construction yes okay and for me being more in the um maybe execution part of trying to solve the problem mm-hmm. i do get the for me circularity is even may, maybe a, even more uh how do you say it like vague definition today in the market mm-hmm. than affordability because and we discussed it with our previous guest as well uh johan van van from madaster everyone is claiming to be circular these days yeah everything and everyone and it's it's kind of frustrating as well because if everyone claims it then it's no longer then yeah it's no longer new or or then it's not about new but then yeah that's very confusing towards the market right yeah. um but what's circular construction for you from a research perspective yeah um so for the the defi- definition of circular uh construction i um I'm mostly looking at what has already been done at the VUB as well. So they're already, I think, for over 10 years, they've been searching for what circular uh, construction is. It's mainly, we focus mainly on uh, what used to be designed for change or to make sure that what you build today can be reused somewhere else, that it can be demountable. Um, so that's mainly what we what we look at at the VUB, I think. Also, uh, at, we look also at urban mining and all of these things, but um, yeah, I think urban mining is also part of the of the of the equation. But that was going to be my question: Is it only reuse, or is it also to get it back into the material? Also, yeah, cycle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't really work on the management of how. So, you know, you can you can work on a lot of a lot of things. My uh, uh, research is mon- mostly on the design of the project itself um, where you have other researchers looking more into management like what happens to glass if it is um, if it after it's used in a building what happens to it where does it go who who takes care of this glass who makes sure that it might be reused in the future that's all not not part of my scope that's uh, Esther Hoos from from our um, uh, faculty is doing this research, for example, um, but that's not part of the the whole. Uh, not a part. Not part of the story. Okay. In my research, yeah. The circular part. Yeah, and the whole part of the research. I think I don't look at the management of what happens after. Ah, yeah, okay. Afterwards. But you do look at reuse. Uh. Um. I think. Reuse, but ma- mostly future reuse, I'd say. Yeah, yeah Like yeah. working with okay. demountable things okay. and stuff like that, yeah. All right, so for the definition of circularity, you're looking at the definition that already exists in the VUB yeah. for many years because of the research that they have done. Yeah, so we have defined, uh, not we, but the people before me have defined... Um, Uh, qualities for circular qualities and circular strategies Uh, yeah if if someone of the listeners is interested you can find them on the website we will also Um, definitely put them in the show notes right Marnie Um, and those those are the the main the main qualities that I'm using in my research I'm not inventing a new idea of circular building because I've already tried to pinpoint what affordable housing or equal equal Quitable housing is so the circular part is more like looking at how these qualities, how these strategies can influence uh, equitable housing, how they can, how equitable housing can benefit from circular strategies and circular qualities that have already been defined. Um, yeah. Okay. That's clear. So we have definitions now, so we can get a 
we can get an idea of what the scope is of what you're trying to do. And the, 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 the goal of the research is to make a positive difference. Okay, and and <clears throat> do you have an idea of how far of a difference you wanted to make? Is that also does that also something that you need to define when you start the research like this? Like, do you do you start and say I want to make housing with my research at the end of my PhD? I want to have a theoretical plan to make housing X percentage more affordable and circular. Mm, that's very difficult to define and okay. to, to measure as well um, because as you said in the beginning every project is super different so it's more about having sort of guidelines having sort of guide in the beginning my plan was to define um, a guide or guidelines for uh, architects so when they are confronted with when they are contacted by a cooperative or, or another um, affordable housing uh, project that they have something to reach to um, to know that uh, if I use this and this circular strategy I will I, I can def the project can definitely benefit of it for this and this and this reason and that it would be backed up by the research that I would be doing um, but after a while and after the interviews I started to realize that architects are not the only ones in the whole story and that they are maybe not the most influential ones. I'm, I'm still trying to find that out um, and I, I am planning on doing a sort of new interview route or workshops or I don't know yet uh, to see for who I will be di directing the, the guide or the results to. Um, but yeah, really measuring how much I want to change the, the yeah, the market, it's, it's not, that's not feasible, I think. Okay. No, definitely not in a PhD research of four years. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, a couple of ways where we can go from here. First of all, yeah, indeed, I can only, um, um, yeah, confirm that an architect is not the only not not the only player in a in a building process for sure and i also question whether he's the most important one mm -hmm. um in my experience when we try to convince the stakeholders to go for a sam which is what we do which is a more circular approach towards utilities i think for us it always starts with convincing the developer of the project yeah and then when that's that's the most important job in our experience and then of course you also need to convince the different stakeholders and there can be many including the architect but it can even come down to as Jona um, one of the previous guests was uh, Jona from uh, the, the group Van Rooy mm -hmm. big, uh, big developer you probably know and he's one of the innovation specialists inside the organization and he told us for example uh, which was a great a great case I've, I've thought that they wanted to implement you know walls in more of their projects and the entire value chain of the big organization that is Van Rooy, from the management to the uh, the the people of purchasing to the the project leaders everyone was convinced and then at the very end the people who needed to install the walls said no that's not something that we're going to do and it didn't go because we have been doing it for 20 years in our way and i don't want to change that i don't know this this is new to me i'm scared of this i don't want to do this and then it stops because management and purchasing is not gonna put walls in a building yeah. that's the people who put walls in the building so that's just an example that i can confirm that it's uh it's not easy to identify one no, no, that's that's <coughs> very true. Um, maybe something in line with what you're you're saying now. Um, I've worked with an architect who um, who indeed uh, who was doing a sort of research uh, project on a single family home, but she was making it completely circular. Um, it's a circular bau betaalbaar wonen project from Vlaanderen Circulair. Um, 
and she explained to me that she wanted to use um, the mountable uh, facade system. And facade click. Facade click, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was click brick. Uh, oh, is that another one? I only know facade. Yeah, or anyway, facade. Anyway, one, the of, mountable, one of those, yes. Yeah, um, and she... Um, she said that because it was a it was it was a building, but it was also a research project, so it was funded as research as well. Um, she um, she told me that they had extra money to to do the to, for the, the 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 contractor to learn how to build in in, uh, in the mountain uh -huh. building uh, bricks, but that after they had this learning process, they said like these click bricks or these these mountable bricks they were actually e very easy to to install if you um, learned it once after that they said like yeah we, we keep on using them because our the, the, the time that we have to spend building uh, in this in this facade click or or in this demountable wall is just a lot shorter than what we had to do previously with a mortar and, and always making sure that everything is straight now they were just doing click 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 and it was just a lot yeah a lot s simpler so it's more about i think it's about first that learning curve but then once you know how to how to install certain um certain systems it can actually become yeah cheaper or more affordable mm -hmm. so yeah because uh, i think that's true by the way um I mean, we, we notice this now as well that we have, I think, our biggest customer to date. I'm not going to name any n names right now, but we are now in the process of finishing off that project and they already came back with another one because they also noticed like, whoa, that's such a big advantage mm -hmm. for the, the, the smaller areas that we are developing on. Um, so... Uh, I think it indeed is often the case that they just need to experience it once and then and as most change but it's difficult because it's we very we very habitual creatures it's very difficult to get us out of our comfort zone yes but that's <coughs> also very um specific or, yeah to the the building industry in, in belgium because if you look at and I, that's a typical example that people that people who believe in circular and then we want to uh, show that circularity is actually not that uh, rocket science. In um, in in the car industry, they have been yeah clicking and screwing everything for a very long time. They in, they innovate a lot faster, and it's it's just the building industry that is kind of going slower, going at a very a much lower pace than yeah than some other industries are going. Do you know that one, it's it's already, I think it's been mentioned multiple times now at this point, but anyway, I'm going to do it again. There's this really famous, I think it was from Deloitte or KPMG, one of those big consultancy agencies that they did a study and the construction market, and it was across European or even, I think also the US included, I don't know anymore. Um, conclusion of the research, the construction is the second slowest innovator of them all, and it's right above hunting. It's hunting, construction. <laughs> but hunting is probably like top 10 smallest industries, and construction is the biggest industry. Yeah. Just to say like, oh my God, this is, that's bad. It's really bad. Yeah. Um, but I think there are changes happening. I think a lot yeah. of, a lot of, uh, people are starting to realize that, uh, yeah, the building industry cannot keep going like it is right now. Um, there's a lot of investment in research. Uh, there are a lot of like, uh, even for for uh, contractors like uh, Confederatie Bau in Belgium uh, or Flanders. I'm not sure which one it is, but they they also are also looking at how can we make our uh, industry more more um, circular and so on. But I think what, what I was saying about uh, the ease of, of putting like these, these bricks, clicking these bricks and stuff, that's actually kind of the, the strength sometimes also of circular, um, of, of circular products and circular ways of building, um, is that one of the, the qualities of circular building is that it's a lot 
that we're trying to make building easier. Um, like easier for the people who are building or easier to understand how a building is actually constructed so that in the future um, when we are trying to demount something or, or, or trying to renovate part of a building that we, we still understand how that building works. And by making a building easier, you can sometimes also um, minimize the time that you spend on building that building. And that way you also just make construction time shorter and that, that also decreases the, the price that you, that you pay for, for workers that are building, if that uh, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Definitely, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I think, as you mentioned, with the facade click, uh, or like the, the very click bricks, it's just an easier process, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It's a, just a more logical solution. Um, how long have you been working on your PhD right now? Um, in November, two years. Okay, so you're halfway. Yes. <laughs> Exciting. Already. <laughs> Any major insights, breakthroughs already? Um, I think my, my main breakthrough I, I just explained where I, I thought about buildings, uh, that affordable housing was mainly money and bricks. And in the end, it turned out that it's so much more, that it's more social and, and things like this. I think that was that was my my, my main insight. Um, what I also really learned was that was how how economy as can can be used as something that is beneficial. Um, that's maybe further in more context. Um, but um, I think my my research as, as so as an archi as an architecture engineering student. Um, economy and, and financing and, and things like this was really like at the back of, of our minds. Uh, we sometimes were not allowed to use marble in a building because it was too expensive, but that was mainly how, how, how close we came to, to knowing anything about the costs and the economy of, of, of building. Um, and what this research showed me was uh, that I needed more knowledge into how things are finance, but also just how economy is working and how this influences, um, yeah, just politics and everything that, and the, the, the market and, and how a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of prices um, are influenced by a market and not necessarily by, I, I'm going to try to put it, I, I'm, th I'm thinking, for example, about how, um, we, how real, how our prices of, of, of sites and stuff like this, how that is very, um, I'm thinking of the word. Say it in Dutch. Um, speculati uh, speculative, how, yeah, how speculative, um, yeah, how speculation on, on houses and, and all of these things, how they are influenced by the market and how this is so much bigger than just architecture in general. Um, yeah. So are you saying that today when you study architectural engineering, which is what you studied, right? Yeah. You get almost no explanation about the economic side of building. Um, it's only focused on like the, the maths and the, the structural engineering and the, the aesthetical elements but very little about the economic side. Uh, we had one, we could take an elective course on economics, but I didn't. Uh, and not many students did actually, <laughs> but... One course. Yes, and, and then there was the, the passive idea of things that would, be, uh, that would be expensive, or like they would say like, yeah, don't use marble, as, as I said before. But yeah, I think we weren't really aware of, of of exact, especially not exact costs. That's something we, we didn't know at all. It's something that you learn during your internship and when you start working. Um, but as a student, it's not really mentioned that often, no. So that's five years of study? Yes, but you have to imagine, this is, uh, I did architecture engineering, so this is like, um, it's like, a, a, an education that brings two things together. So you have 
the whole structural uh, structural story, like calculating beams, uh, understanding how a structure works, and then you have the whole uh, spatial designing, uh, thinking about social values, environmental values, and all of that comes together in one study, uh, one one yeah one education, and it's just I think adding economics would just make students head go. <laughs> it's <laughs> would just make it them explode. It's 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 a lot. I think that's maybe also something about architecture is that it it takes into account so many different levels. It's super it's super systemic. It takes into account a lot of different disciplines and and, and or different it touches upon different disciplines that it's sometimes yeah hard to teach them all in five years. I think mm -hmm. yeah. so it's quite a lot already. Yeah, I think so. No, yeah, again, I didn't study it, so I don't know. But I do find it strange because how you explain it now is that the cost of a building is not even an element that's being considered while, unless it, it's like about, let's put marble in there or not. But yeah, I've been active in the industry now for five, six years, trying to put something new in, in the market. Um, and what I have learned is that there's a huge issue in the market today with architects designing something that goes to the developer. The developer says, ooh, that looks nice. And then that goes to the general contractor. And then the general contractor says, yeah, yeah, that looks nice. But because of this, 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 and this, my construction costs increases with X percent, mm -hmm. and we are now X percent above your budget, Mr. Developer. And then it goes back to Mr. Developer and he says, oh God, this is not what I, I can't build it for this. And then he has a difficult conversation with the architect. And then that thing took like 18 to 24 months. Yeah. Because then the architect needs to like redo the building again, big part of it. And then that game starts again, which is why from what I understand now, they're working more and more in these build teams by from which the developer is already putting the architect and the general contractor earlier together in the process to identify these things of like, hey, don't do not do this because this will lead to that. Yeah. So maybe, is that something that you also learned from your research that there needs to be more attention maybe in the studies towards the economical side? in the design making already or not is that oh am i now mm, seeing something maybe that's yeah maybe there needs to be more uh passive knowledge on the other hand i think yeah as an architect if you're constantly uh thinking yeah i'm, I'm thinking more like the that's maybe what my my the design guidelines that i wanted to make want to make with my research what they are more about, they are more, they, they kind of give you an estimation or an idea of which uh, design decisions can uh, decrease the costs of a, of a circular building. So that architects don't necessarily have to calculate every time how much something will cost, but that they, they can get a general idea. Um, because what you're saying is indeed true that, uh, and I think it's even sometimes paralyzing as well for designers that they just don't do something because they think it will be expensive, but they actually don't, don't know. even know. So I, I think that's where, where my research tries to kind of, and uh, kind of show that this decision can actually decrease costs. And um, have you identified a couple of those already? Um, like general goals? That's what I'm currently looking at. So I'm trying to now define sort of the hypothesis of what, which, um, a few hypotheses that I will study more in depth. Uh, one of them would be that you um, would build more by yourself, yourself. So as I was explaining, circular building is also about making things more uh, simple to understand and more simple to build. Um, and that could also maybe... Uh, increase the the DIY movement doing building parts of your building yourself and that way decreasing costs because you're decreasing labor costs um, but currently I, I've already studied a few examples but I'm not 
not convinced yet on that part, um, but I, it could be, it, it's still under, under research. Under development. Yeah, under development. Um, another, um, yeah, something that has shown to, to make a difference is if you already think about future renovations beforehand. Um, for example, that project that I spoke about before, who used uh, the demountable facade, we did a study um, where we looked at, um, we, we uh, compared a, ca a, sim a normal cavity wall, so a conventional cavity wall, where bricks are um, with, uh, glued with mortar, um, and then we compared it with the cavity wall that has the demountable bricks. And um, we, we said like, okay, let's run it through a sort of scenario where we would every 25 years uh, change the insulation of the building. Um, so yeah, energy prices are rising and we thought this might be a, a probable scenario. Um, and so uh, what you would have to do to change the insulation would be to break down uh, the, the, the bricks on the facade and change the insulation and then build the bricks again. For the conventional, uh, yeah, so add ins new insulation and then build the bricks. Um, for the conventional um, facade, you would tear down the, the bricks and then buy new ones and build a new, a new uh, facade. While for the demountable one, you would just put the, uh, yeah, demount the, the bricks, put them aside and put them again put them up again, so you don't have to buy new bricks. And this actually showed um, that in, in, in se uh, 75 years, you would save about, I think it was 80 or 90 euro per square meter. For And that means that you did three renovations where you changed uh, the, 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 the insulation, if that makes sense. So it's, yeah, it's making sure that you take into account these quite probable scenarios can really um, make a difference in, in the prices that you have in the long term. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, of course. Um, something that did pop into my mind while you were explaining this is we look into the future 24 more months and you graduate with a very successful PhD, <laughs> of course. Um, Let's hope so. Yes, uh, I, uh, I hope, I will hope as well. Um, but how does your research, the output of your research, the output of all your hard work, looking into this very interesting problem, how does that translate to the reality? How, for example, you you conclude your PhD and there are like, let's call it seven, uh, seven is a fun number, there are seven things, seven rules that, based on my research, every architect in Belgium or in Europe or in the world should keep in mind while developing a building or while designing a building that will allow to be, to create more circular buildings, right? Is there like a fixed way how this knowledge is going to get communicated towards these people? Not fixed, no. Um, but I'm really looking into, yeah, sort of um, which medium I would communicate it in. Um, one would be to have, yeah, a, a sort of maybe principles that architects can use, that they can download from the internet. Another way could be to have a lecture series, um, have workshops. Um, maybe it could be also a sort of video, small videos, but I'm, I'm still really looking into how I will communicate this because I think it's important that it doesn't stay with just a scientific 500 page book. <laughs> if I even get, yeah. Is but it 500 pages? For some it is, yeah. I don't know how much I will oh. write, but... Oh, God. <laughs> um, sometimes it can it can take up about that much. That's, um, that's half a lot of the gangs. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's four years yeah, yeah, in one yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's true. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I, I don't think that this will really be valuable to people in practice. Um, so I, I am looking at ways to translate it. I have uh, There's one 
colleague of mine who's uh, graduating soon or well she's still she still has to do her jury but who who has finished her phd now um and she has developed a, a website with actions for architecture um and so this in this website architects can see um yeah what they can how they can uh develop more circular buildings um and so maybe it will be something of that format but then again there are already a lot of websites doing this maybe i will it will be another tab on that website saying like actions for architecture and affordability or i don't know something like this um but that's really not yet i, I still have to think about that more but is that part of a phd is there time and, and budget calculated into these research assignments to translate the knowledge that's been generated into the market is that a thing that's part of it yeah my um the phd funding or the phd program that i'm on is really um looking more at how can we help practice so in a sense yes uh, my my goal should be at least to have a prototype of of a of a, a research tool or like a video or something like this. So to at least have a prototype, but I, I hope to actually already translate my knowledge into something usable. usable. So yeah, I think yeah, it's, it's part of the, the, the research to translate knowledge into practice. Nice, I think that's, that's key. Because if you build this very valuable 500 page book, I also know a lot of architects by now and a lot of people active in construction I don't think they're gonna take the time to read it through even though it can be hugely valuable um, so I think it would be very good if, if, if there's like indeed a more accessible way of, of um, communicating this new these new insights yeah all right I'm quickly gonna check time how long are we are we going Marnie 50 Whoa, time flies. Um, let's see what's what's interesting to to pick up in these final minutes. You're still quite young, right? Uh, yes. How old are you? Today? Twenty-five. Oh, okay. Very young. Um, what's the like? Is this problem something that you see yourself? working on longer like even after the phd and if so like basically the question that i'm trying to get to is like do you have a, a, an ultimate goal like for your career or for this problem is it something that you see yourself working on long time and if so in in, in which form mm, yeah so my immediate goal is to finish the phd of course <laughs> the dissertation um but uh in the long term, yeah, I think what I what I really enjoy now uh, with my PhD is that it's very uh, it, it touches upon a lot of different subjects, so financing, um, uh, or at least yeah, financing um, on on uh, building, designing, uh, and, and and social uh, aspects as well, and that's really something that I indeed want to continue. Uh, which shape that will get, I'm not sure. Um, I also really enjoyed, in, in one sense, I really enjoy the academic world where I can uh, teach uh, and, and gather knowledge and, and create knowledge and, and share that further. Um, on the other hand, I think having a more practice appro practical approach, like working on actual projects and, and realizing actual projects would also be something that I would be really interested in. So, yeah, I think... I think it can it can both go both ways for me. Um, what my real goal would be is to just inspire, um, just inspire architects and designers and and developers and to to show them that what what they often think is that making sustainable buildings, making circular buildings, is more expensive. Is 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 taking it will take a lot more budget and stuff. But I just really want to inspire them and show them like. It's not necessarily if you make the right choices in the right context, it it might not it might even you might even benefit. I mean you chances are that you will benefit. Um and if I just already can inspire some people, that that would just already be one of my goals, I think. 
I don't like to look at me being 50 and, and having a goal. It's not really me. <laughs> but I think, yeah, inspiring and, and, and seeing that others, others can benefit from, from the research I did, I think that's already something that I, I would be really happy with. It's a very valuable goal in and out of itself, for sure. That's true. All right. Um, let's see. Maybe we just f f round off with a couple of more like light questions. Uh, these are a couple of fun questions we always ask at the end. Um, if you could have a drink with anybody dead or alive, who would it be? Um, yeah, so uh, I think that would be uh, Kate Raworth from who wrote The Donut Economy, the okay. book The Donut Economy. Um, her, yeah. That's <laughs> her, a new one. Yeah. Yeah. Her her book. She's an uh, an English an English. Uh, I think yeah, right, economist, um, who wrote yeah the book the Donut Economy, where she explains how we can uh, how how we are currently kind of have the feeling that we are serving the economy, while actually the economy could serve us and could help us to to answer some of the problems that we are having today with uh, environment and social problems as well. And she kind of shows an, an alternative model, an alternative economy. Um, and it really, it, really opened my, it really opened my mind um, to thinking outside of the box and thinking a way of how our society currently works. Um, yeah, I don't feel like I can change anything or even she can change everything but at least she inspires people with that and I would really love to have a conversation with her and learn more from her so and I drink yeah. but you don't think that you can change anything no no I think no no but I think that I cannot change everything that's right. what I mean okay. to say yeah okay. I will not change the whole market system the whole housing market system I, I don't believe that but as I said if I can inspire people that's okay um, but I think yeah her her book and her uh, her models have already inspired many people. Um, I often I often hear uh, when I say talk about her models that people are like, ah, yeah, we we know her. She she changed our mind, and for me, that's the same thing. I yeah, I really think she did well. Great answer. Yeah, I, I've heard about the donut economy, but I didn't know the name of the the writer. Okay, cool. <laughs> Maybe um, that's a fun one. I, I recently heard a lot on a, on a podcast that I'm listening. Um, it's not in the preparation, but if you so you don't if you don't have an answer, it's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's an it's a it's a cool question. Like, what's the kindest thing anyone has ever done for you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to answer right now. It's not that people are not kind to me, because I feel like a lot of people are kind to me, but... Hmm. I don't no know. No problem. Um, yeah, and then the, the final question is also something that you actually probably already answered. Like, oh, is there another book? Like, the, the question that we always ask is, like, if there's one specific book that you could advise to our listeners, but you already maybe highlighted one yeah but i i can tell you about another one yeah definitely um it's uh the good ancestor so the donut economy is one of the books i would recommend but uh the good ancestor is another one it's actually written by her husband <laughs> um, whoa power couple yeah of which i have forgot the name because it's a very complicated one but uh the good ancestor is the the, the uh, name of the of the book um, it's about long-term thinking and how many problems that we are facing today also have to do with the fact that we think very short-term um, and that if we could look, think more in the future and invest in our future and the future generations and think, and think about them act and actively think about them when we are making decisions, that we could, that that would already solve many problems that we are having today. 
and he kind of gives like uh, small tips and tricks also on how you can think for future generations. Um, yeah, and that also really inspired me a lot. So awesome! Some great book recommendations. Rec my recommendations, recommendations to end with. All right, Michael, unless there's anything else you want to communicate to the audience, I think this is a good place to end for this, uh, this first, first edition. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no, you, uh, thank you for, for coming and making time. Um, maybe in two years' time, when we're still doing this, we, uh, we can invite you again, and then you can come and explain us the other insights you got out of doing this, this research. Yes, it will be much more concrete then. All hopefully. right. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, let's talk again in a couple of years. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Bow Podcast. If you enjoyed this conversation, make sure to subscribe to our channel. If you're interested in Bow Living in our Smart Adaptable Module or SAM, go check out our website, bowliving.com. If you want to stay up to date, you can best subscribe to our monthly newsletter on our website or follow us on all social media platforms where we're named at Bow Living.